Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by Mandrill, the best way to send transactional email from the people who make MailChimp. Sign up today at mandrill.com. And by Turnstone, more than furniture, Turnstone is an experience. Go to myturnstone.com slash twist to learn more and receive 10% off your first order. And Amazon Web Services, the fastest growing, hottest startups build their businesses on Amazon Web Services. Learn more at aws.amazon.com slash startups. Calacanis, this is This Week in Startups, uh, a big action-packed Friday news roundtable for you today. Twitter uh, has filed for their IPO, closed a deal with the NFL, lots to discuss there. Uh, AngelList closed a $24 million huge round of funding and launched syndicates, a way for uh, groups of angels to get together and fund companies, and it's exploded. Uh, and finally, uh, we have a new app, which is a collaborative version of Vine. Yes, many users working on one video stream. It's a really uh, exciting technology. Stick with us. It's going to be an amazing episode. It's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. But funny how it feeds my people. We ain't going to live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Money is the root of all evil. But funny how it feeds my people. Hey everybody, it's Jason Calacanis, and this is This Week in Startups, the program where we talk about technology companies, founding them, starting them, investing in them, and growing them, all that kind of interesting stuff. We do two shows a week. On Tuesdays, I interview somebody of note, and then on Friday, I have a couple of my friends on the program to talk about the news of the week, and that's what you're listening to right now, is the news round table. A um, couple of uh, plugs. We are going to be hosting the Launch Hackathon uh, in just a couple of, uh, maybe 42 days from now, as you can see on my screen. We're going to have a 1,000 developers in San Francisco building stuff over the weekend, and whoever uh, builds the best uh, product is going to win an investment prize of $100,000 from my angel investing fund called the Launch Fund. And we might even syndicate that to AngelList Syndicate, which is now at 300000 So this could be even bigger, but we'll, uh, let's not get ahead of ourselves. We'll talk about the syndicate thing in a, in a little bit. Uh, it's November 8th, 9th, and 10th in San Francisco. You can go to hackathon.launch.co, hackathon.launch.co. Co. And uh, Kevin Rose, a uh, serial entrepreneur and working at Google Ventures now, is going to kick it off on Friday night with a fireside chat with me. So it's going to be a great event, the Launch Hackathon on November 8th, 9th, and 10th. And if you work at one of those big technology companies, I think Google, Facebook, uh, and a bunch of Amazon, a bunch of people are already sponsoring the event, but we could always use more people to buy pizza and food and all kinds of good stuff. So please uh, do uh, email me if you've got any ideas, uh, jason at inside.com. Also, we're going to be doing This Week in Startups live on the road. Go to twistlive.launch.co. October 4th, my guest will be Steve Jurvetson in San Francisco. He's the venture capitalist who invested in SpaceX and Tesla and a bunch of other awesome companies. October 10th, the co-founder of Reddit, Alexis, will be with me in New York City. He also did Hipmunk, another great startup. And then I'll be jumping up uh, to Boston on October 11th to sit down with my good friend, angel investor, Bill Warner. He also created the Avid video editing software. And... Um, yeah, these are all almost sold out, and, and they're basically free. We just charge $2 to make sure people don't buy up a bunch of tickets. So it's basically free. Go to twistlive.launch.co. Okay, on the program with me today, uh, two great uh, serial guests on the program. Farhad Manju is with us. He was previously with Slade and Wired. He's now at the Wall Street Journal. Farhad, how are you doing? Good, thanks. Good to be here. Uh, how was week one at the Wall Street Journal? Is this week one uh, or week two? No, it was week one. It was great. Uh, I wrote a column. I saw myself in the stipple portrait thing, which is cool. Um, yeah. It's good. I, yeah. In a way, um, you, I mean, working for Slate and Wired is cool, but Wall Street Journal, I mean, that's a kind of a, I don't know, is that the, is that the highest uh, honor as a business journalist, do you think? Uh, I don't know. It's up there, <laughs> man. It's up there. You gotta, your parents must be very proud of you at this point. What do you it's, do? It's nice. It, 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 for the first time, they know of a place where I work. Before, I was like, "What? where do you work? They They're have like, no what idea. is this slate thing? You're working on a right. slate? How does it work? Yeah, exactly. All right, very <laughs> good. Uh, also with us, GMB, Gina Bianchini is with us, the founder of Mighty Bell, previously Ning, and also the co-founder of the Lean In organization, uh, which you may have heard of. Welcome back to the program, Gina. Thank you for having me, Jason. Um, and uh, what's new in your world? Mighty Bell community is growing. Mighty Bell communities we launched, which are basically 
a community organized into groups uh, that are learning and sharing together. So bringing education and community together in, in one spot. And we've seen tremendous growth in four weeks since they've been live. So that's keeping me busy. And it's uh, got a lot of great stuff launching shortly. And I know that you have the um, Lean In is doing a bunch of these uh, communities, right? So women who are trying to, you know, grow their careers or getting together in groups. Yeah. Women and men. Oh. Are in Lean In circles, which are uh, small groups of eight to ten people that are self-organizing and meeting regularly around topics of professional development and um, navigating, navigating their goals. Love it. Uh, I, is it similar to this trend that I hear about all the time, uh, mastermind groups? You know, I, I think there's threads of, of similarities, but I really think, you know, what's so cool about whether it's anything related to your goals and different kinds of goals, but the, the evidence and research is pretty clear that getting together in smaller groups really matters, which is why, you know, if you think about class size or you think about sections or study groups, just how important those were growing up um, or when you're in school, the same thing is true for bringing people together around their interests, their passions, their goals. Awesome. We'll continue to success with everybody. Check out MightyBell.com. All right. It was a big news week, um, and I think one of the biggest stories, um, Angel List, which is a basically the Facebook of angel investors, you could consider it, um, or LinkedIn would be maybe a better uh, analogy, has raised $24 million, and they launched a program called Syndicates. Um, the round was read by Atlas. The, the round of investment in AngelList was led by Google Ventures and Atlas Ventures, and just every angel on the planet was involved with it. Um, uh, for full background, I'm, I'm on the service all the time. I'm one of the top five or ten users in terms of number of followers, but I actually joined, uh, full disclosure, the syndicate process. And the way it works is uh, people who are angel investors agree to invest in whatever I invest in, and then I get a piece of whatever the gain is on their money. So if they invest you know, $10,000 and it turns into 100, I get whatever, 15% of that gain, the $90,000 as it were, uh, which is exactly how a venture capital fund works. So it's sort of pop-up venture capital groups. Uh, Farha, what do you think here? Is this a big deal? Is this going to change the face of startups? So so you guys are, are more in touch with this angel world than I am, obviously. I, I don't, I'm not an angel investor. So I guess the first, I, I actually have some questions about, about yeah. the syndicate. So what is it that you like, I understand that you're pooling other people's money in in this sort of more streamlined way, but I don't like. Couldn't those people invest in the same things before? Like, what is it that you get from this that you couldn't get, you couldn't do in the past? Right. So access to deals, I guess, would be the the number one thing. So what they're basically saying is, hey, if I'm an angel investor from Boise, Idaho, and I'm not in the yeah. valley, and I don't have the connections of Kevin Rose or you know, Naval or Shervin or whatever other angel investor, I'll just agree to put $5,000 into each of the five deals they do a year, hoping that if they do an Uber investment or a Twitter investment, I'm caught up in that. So basically, it's access and deal selection. It's like having somebody pick your bets for you. Right. Okay. Well, and, I think, um, and I think the other side of that as well is, is from an entrepreneur's perspective, the ability to access a greater number or potential set of angel investors is also pretty huge. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. I mean, I I, I hate to make myself part of the story, um, you know. And yet. But yet, you know, <laughs> if you look at the uh, syndicate here, uh, this is the angel.co slash syndicate. In just four days of doing this, I've never seen anything like this. Myself and Dave Morin both have over 50 people who are backing our deals and for, not that it's a race or anything, but uh, 300,000 and change here. I have 327,000. He has 318,000. That's after three or four days. This could conceivably, I think, grow. And I typically invest 50 or $100,000 in a startup, maybe as high as 250. But this will potentially add, well, right now, 300,000. Could, could this could get to a million. Uh, Gina, if I were able to get the syndicate to a million and I was originally putting in 250, what would... How would that change how you as an entrepreneur would look at me as an angel? Well, we would like you more. Yeah. Um, so Why? That. Why would you but like us more? No, no, no. In, in all seriousness, what I, what, I think, what I think this has the potential to do, and you're starting to see this trend pretty much across the board, which is there are some things about the venture capital fundraising process that 
create the conditions for uh, irrational decisions. And mm -hmm. what this actually has the potential to do is similar to you know, Kickstarter or similar to um, other types of places where crowdsourcing has really made a difference in terms of finding, um, finding winners or even just finding support for things that may not look like the standard typical you know, 20 something male computer science major out of Stanford who has a new idea. That I think is the potential and power of of what is happening on Angel List, and you know we are human beings on both sides of this marketplace, and so there's going to be inherent bias or pattern matching and recognition, and I think that the more that there are alternative sources of capital, and that it's it's you know potentially you know has the has the opportunity to. Um, create greater access to capital for people who don't necessarily fit the pattern. That is a trend that is only positive. Yeah, I think that's that's a really astute uh, observation. Um, also, I think the decision-making gets quicker here too, doesn't it, Gene? I mean, you've raised yeah. money countless number of times. When you go to a yeah. VC firm, you how many of the partners do you have to get to agree at a VC firm to give you the money? Typically, it's two thirds, yeah. and typically there is a lot of hand wringing, and and you know, and then the, you know, the the dirty secret of venture capital is they actually, one of the greatest areas of competitive advantage for new funds when they have chosen to do this, is the fast no, yeah. um, and yet you'd be shocked, and and I see this with companies I advise and and uh, participate in which is the number of VC firms that will not actually give you a no or move quickly. Ah. And so that is just wasting entrepreneurs' time. And, and why, does a VC, why does a VC not want to give you a no? Why, why can't they, they, they do wanna, that? Yeah. yeah, so if you, if you listen to those that do it, they, they want to keep their options open. Ah. And they're concerned that if they come out with a no, and this is, cha this is changing in part because you have firms on Sand Hill Road of former entrepreneurs who actually sit there and say, no, we're not going to do things that way. Um, yeah. and, and I think that that's actually a really positive thing because mm -hmm. you know, the only thing we really have, and actually as entrepreneurs, and, and you know this probably better than most, is we have our time. Right. And every single day, is you know one step closer to death, mm -hmm. and so this idea that you know anything that can be introduced into the system and the ecosystem that can drive speed of decision making and also um, distributed risk taking mm. is going to be a good thing. And you know again, I, I mean I see every day that there are just obvious arbitrage opportunities in in angel investing and early stage investing. Um, when you look outside the patterns and you question, you know, conventional thinking and conventional wisdom about what are, you know, what are the same metrics that everybody else is looking at. Mm. And I, I look at that as the greatest opportunity of, of Angelus really becoming a force of, of nature in this, in this world. Farhad, what do you, what do you think? Uh, anything to add there? Um, I mean, I, I guess I'm a little... I'm a little skeptical that it's that much of a transformative change. I think, I think it, you know, it, this sort of hinges on whether, the question about whether there is enough or to, um, whether there's any shortage of money in the valley. And it seems like, you know, any kind of good idea these days can attract funding. So I don't really know yeah. if adding more funding changes the nature of startups. I, I was reading, I think Hunter Walk was write, writing that this may change, this may um, uh, give you sort of new funds for things that kind of traditional VCs and traditional angels have been reluctant to go to things like, uh, like uh, startups that are international or that might be a little risque, like having to do with drugs or something like that, which is kind of interesting. But mm -hmm. I don't really know that this changes the nature of the, the, you know, of the kind of typical startup that gets funded here. Like, especially if, you know, you, like if you, so far, I mean, it's early, but if you and Dave Morin are like examples of people who have really gotten, uh, you know, more, you know, a lot of followers this way, um, I mean, I mean, you were an angel before, and this just gives you more power, but it doesn't give you, like, I mean, it's not sort of a new kind of angel who's having, who kind of... Yeah, chooses. that's a fair point. It's, you know, but when you think about 
being able to close an entire round. You know, I can't will a company into closing their angel round right. previously. I could give them 50 or 100 and say, good luck getting the other 500. But I think what's going to happen right now is Dave and I could agree, you know, based on where it's at right now, and we could collectively have 800,000 in the company yeah. three days in. I mean, Dave and I could do an A round right now almost. So it's, this is going right. to... This well, is, and I would also, yeah. you know, I, I mean, very respectfully, yeah. if you've never raised money before yourself directly, yeah. that the notion that, oh, yes, there's enough money out there for any good idea in Silicon Valley is a meritocracy, um, you've never raised money before. <laughs> right, exactly. And it's a slow process. Hey, so when we get back from uh, commercial break, let's talk about the Twitter IPO and the NFN, NFL deal. Hey, uh, let me just take a quick moment to thank Mandrill App, transactional email from our good friends at MailChimp with servers all over the world. So delivery is instantaneous everywhere. They have amazing real-time analytics, and they'll monitor performance and make improvements, uh, and you'll be able to make improvements very easily. They have mobile apps for iOS and Android, so you can be monitoring uh, and troubleshooting all of your transactional emails to make sure they get through. What are transactional emails? If you don't know, those are the, hey, reset my password. Hey, you got a message on the service. Hey, you got a friend request. Hey, somebody wants to join your syndicate on AngelList. All those incredible, important emails that re-engage you with the product um, and increase engagement. That's what uh, transactional email is. And they literally roll out new features every week for Mandrill App, including A-B split testing built into the product. Uh, we use it for the launch hackathon. So when people sign up for the hackathon, we, um, we you know, give them, uh, you know, confirmations and that kind of stuff that they've joined a team, et cetera. It works really well. And pricing is incredible. First 12,000 emails a month are always free. And after that, you pay just based on usage. And you never pay for more than you use. No feature gating. All features available to all users. Sign up at mandrill.com. And go ahead and thank at Mandrill App on Twitter. Mandrill, M-A-N-D-I-R-L-L. Think of a man drilling. There you go, mandrill.com. Okay, um, Twitter's IPO, Twitter's IPO. Uh, everybody's buzzing about that. A lot of people are going to get rich. A lot of uh, housing prices are going to go up in Noe Valley. Um, <laughs> but they also closed a big deal with the NFL this week. Um, and Farhad, you uh, wrote a great piece, actually, I just uh, read this morning, about uh, Twitter. And it being actually a little quirky and weird, explain what you mean by the sort of weird or oddness of Twitter versus the sort of plain vanilla oatmeal of Facebook. Yeah, I mean, I so I use Twitter all the time. I use it much more than I use Facebook. Um, and I think I use it because it sort of serves my needs as a, as a public person, like a journalist. Like, I need to uh, follow the news. I need to uh, tweet out my articles. Um, I don't see it as having that same kind of appeal to quote unquote regular people, people who aren't big news junkies and people who just aren't public, you know, like if you are a doctor or if you're a lawyer, um, you know, depending on what kind of law, law you do, like it, there's no great marketing opportunities for you on Twitter as compared to Facebook. And like Facebook has this, uh, this thing that everyone likes, which is uh, your friends and your family, which is sort of of natural appeal to everyone. So I, I was essentially arguing that Twitter is a more inherently kind of a nichier product than Facebook, which is not to say it's small. Like it, you know, it still attracts hundreds of millions of users, but um, it's of more limited appeal, and that's what's great about it, I think. And I worry that if uh, they face pressure to grow faster either revenues or users, um, that they might morph into something closer to Facebook and, and lose what's great about Twitter now. Gina, how, how do you compare the two services and sort of how they work together or don't? Because it does seem that everybody has a Facebook page and only certain people, you know, even start Twitter handles, let alone, you know, use it on a regular basis. Is there some way to easily explain why one appeals to 20% of people and the other appeals to 100%? Yeah, I mean, what I found is any and all times where we've tried to use personal or anecdotal, you know, this is how certain people use Facebook or this is how certain people use Twitter, at least in my experience, the reality is that outside of the fact that Facebook is simply just bigger, hmm. like a lot bigger, um, the anecdotal evidence doesn't necessarily prove out um, in the data. 
So the thing that I actually think is the most interesting about Twitter and, and you know, when you go and you talk to folks, this week was Advertising Week in New York, and, and what's happening and some of the conversations that are happening, I'm hearing behind, you know, closed doors or seeing behind closed doors, really are around how Twitter has been doing a much better job of of positioning itself as the you know social soundtrack to television mm -hmm. and actually doing a much better job of tying itself to TV ad spends and TV ad budgets. And I think that that is actually the most interesting element and reinforced by the NFL deal and things along those lines that even though the service in Facebook is so much bigger and, and everything you're saying you've heard about you know, Twitter being a strange service that you kind of have to get used to using that TV for example which you know has a vast amount of advertising revenue associated with it um, that has not moved over to digital in the ways that I think anybody you know predicting 15 or 20 years ago would think that it was going to move that they are actually the best position to take advantage of that, despite the fact that it's a strange service and despite the fact that it's smaller than Facebook. It, it does seem, Farhad, tell me if I'm wrong, that Facebook has not figured out media and news. They figured out like personal photos and your kid photos, and it just seems like Twitter has nailed the news and the entertainment cycle. And maybe it's because all the journalists and you know the intelligentsia are, are on Twitter, but Twitter is better for news and media, correct? Yeah, I mean, and I think Gina's right. I mean, t Twitter is tied into TV. The way people use Twitter is tied into the way that they watch TV. Um, and, I mean, I think it's obvious why. It's because Twitter is much more real-time than Facebook. Um, t what Twitter does is sync up all these people talking about the same thing at the same time. Uh, and Facebook doesn't really do that because newsfeed is a, uh, you know, an uh, algorithmically uh, generated list of things that are happening to your friends and your family, not things that are happening right now. So that's the major sort of functional difference that leads to these two different use cases. Um, so yeah, I mean, and, and you know, I think that a couple, a few weeks ago, Nielsen did the, released this study where they showed that there's like a significant relationship between how people use Twitter and TV ratings, which is a huge thing because that that suggests that like when people, when advertisers kind of tie their campaigns, uh, you know, integrate. Twitter campaigns with TV campaigns that, you know, that's a natural kind of way to buy ads. It's, a, it's kind of a platform that Facebook, um, you know, has, has tried to make that connection, but I don't think it's as, as clear. Um, I think that's a pretty uh, great description, though. I mean, because Twitter feeds are in reverse chronological order just by date, so whatever was said last by your friends is up top. Facebook doesn't do that. Facebook is about this re-engagement of like, here's something from two days ago that now is getting more velocity, so we're going to pick the order of your feed. Is that a mistake on Facebook's part, or is it, it seems like the right answer for when you're doing photos, because you want to know the most important family photo, not all the family photos, but in news, you, you do want to know the Breaking Bad stuff right now. Do you think Facebook can ever service both? I'll put that up um, to either of you. Yeah. I I mean, they have this tab, right? They have this most recent tab, but I, I really think that's not what it's for. And I, I, I think newsfeed is great because it does give you this summary. Because there's just so, if they didn't do that, there would be so much stuff on Facebook that it would be, it would be kind of incomprehensible. Yeah, I um, I think this NFL deal is kind of interesting. They've been doing a lot of deals right now, where they're putting video clips onto Twitter that are hosted. By Twitter, so in a way like YouTube, but only for select partners, um, and they have a couple of dozen. It's, it's over forty at this point. Video partners, but nobody seems to be picking up on this in the news, Gina. Well, if Twitter launched full-blown video hosting on it, what impact would that have on like a YouTube, say? I don't know that it would have an immediate impact. Um, you know, they're they're used in some different ways by different people. Um, and again, like any anything to the contrary is anecdotal at this point, you know. Right. So you 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 know, as I'm out talking to folks, I hear, you know, especially amongst my friends who really uh, understand like teen and youth behavior and culture, that you're seeing kind of a resurgence of teens going to to Twitter. I don't know if that's true. Um, you also hear things like, 
Um, YouTube is the new Google for people kind of under the age of 21. They'll go to YouTube first to start searching something um, very naturally in a way that, you know, we, over 21 you would use Google. Yeah. So I think there's some, some interesting things along those lines. I do think that it just seems natural that Twitter is going to get richer in terms of the media types on it. And especially when you are the social soundtrack for television, yeah. snippets and being able to kind of keep that thread going make a ton of sense from a product perspective. And we're, and we're having, it seems like, a an all-out war, although nobody's really talking about it much, of who's going to license these video clips. You have, obviously, the Netflixes and the Amazons of the world going after House of Cards and winning Emmys, but now you have Marissa taking the SNL library off of YouTube, YouTube uh, now blocking any SNL clips in the United States because Marissa bought it for Yahoo. Now you have Adam Bain and the Twitter group taking the NFL clips. This is going to be... Uh, an all-out war of people spending money to buy exclusive right to clips. Do you think, Farhad? Yeah, it's interesting. I, one of the things I wonder, wonder about the Twitter, so I don't even, I don't know. I couldn't figure this out, and I actually haven't talked to the people at Twitter, but, like, are the NFL clips going to be six seconds or less? Um, because this is this, like, Twitter has, you know, in all of its stuff, it has this, in both in videos and obviously in tweets, it has this length limit, either six seconds or 140 characters. And that doesn't make sense for a whole lot of things. I mean, it makes sense for some news items and for sports, maybe, but there are some sports clips, lots of sports clips that are longer than six seconds. So I wonder, I wonder if Twitter... No, would these be are going to be full platform. clips. Yeah, they're going to be full 30-second yeah, so minute clips. I mean, that's, these yeah. are not Vine clips. These are full-on... Big right. Clips. So that, I mean, I think the, my worry with that is that changes the nature of Twitter. Like it, it makes it into a different, a, a more Facebook like platform. I mean, I'm sure that'll be inviting to some people, especially football fans, but. Um, I just, I love the fact of a single identity right now. Cause you know, this week in startups winds up on the YouTube channel and we have a Twitter channel telling people to go to YouTube and we have fans over, we have 30,000 people over at YouTube and I've got 170,000 people on Twitter. Why can't that just be one identity? I would much rather just host my stuff, you know, it, on Twitter and just have everybody geeking out over there and hosting the videos there. So if Twitter's listening, like, just let anybody host full-on videos up there. Like, let's just go for it, man. I, we need more competition. Um, let me take a quick moment to thank our second sponsor uh, for making This Week in Startups possible. You know, the show's got four or five people working full-time on it. That's why we have these great guests. That's why we have all the great stories set up and uh, ready to go. And one of those is My Turnstone. Uh, these guys make simple and smart furniture solutions for small businesses and startups. We use them here. I'm actually standing at a uh, My Turnstone stand-up desk right now. I'm standing, I'm not sitting, you know, hey, good exercise, engaging my core, all that kind of good stuff. And um, you can see the beautiful stuff here on my screen. Great desks, great credenzas, uh, built-in couches, and they have this new um, classy but relaxed uh, buoy, which is a little thing you sit on, and you can raise and lower it and engages your core, and they're all coming in all different great, beautiful colors. Um, go to myturnstone.com slash twist, myturnstone.com slash twist, and get 10% off your first order. And by the way, that's not like 10% off software. That's 10% off hardware, physical devices, right? So that's a pretty good deal for our loyal customers. And send me a picture of you on a buoy or at your turnstone desk to turnstone at launch.co, and we'll enter you into a free lunch with me. Um, contest ends September 30th. So go ahead and take a picture of yourself working hard, grinding away on your startup, at uh, and then send it to turnstone at launch.co to be entered into a free lunch with me. We'll go somewhere really nice. Okay, um, let's talk about the launch of the week. A bunch of different new products uh, started this week. Perhaps one of the most interesting was uh, Jump Cam, which is a collaborative video app. It's sort of like Vine. You tell all your friends um, and they can immediately add videos to your video and you make the sort of mashup. Uh, and the vi videos continue to evolve over time, and, and no editing is required. They raised $2.7 million from Trinity Ventures and Google Ventures, and I think I actually have a video here I can play. Um, is uh, my, uh, f yeah, there we go. So anyway, here's a bunch of people, I guess, saying hello in their language. Ciao. Konnichiwa. Ciao. What up? Hello. All right, kind of interesting. What do you what do you think, Gina? You're into the community space. Co community created collaborative vines. Interesting, huh? 
Yeah. There you have it. I mean, it is yeah. interesting. Is it going to take off? Are people going to do this, or is this just way too complicated? I don't know. You know, I, I think with any of these, there is fundamental behavior that people want to do. And it's just a very interesting question that I think everybody, increasingly with the number of companies that are coming out, you know, day in and day out, you know, it's like, yeah, that's, that's cool. Yeah, Let's see what happens with it. <laughs> yeah, this is pretty wild. What do you think, Farhad? Um, I think it's a good idea. The only thing is, like, it seems like an easy idea for for Instagram or Vine to do by themselves. Like, it seems like a feature to those products rather than a whole new a whole new feed to maintain and a whole new product to uh, kind of a whole new way to 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 look at video. So I like the idea. I like the idea of um, video being collaborative. I just don't know if it needs to be a whole new thing. All right, uh, and obviously you log in with your Facebook credentials. You find your friends. You invite them to do these contests. Let's look at our second one here. This is uh, Sigmo, a tiny chip that translates natural language for communicating while traveling or with foreigners. They've raised 175k on Indiegogo. Um, they had a $15,000 goal, talking about crowdfunding, and it ends next week. And we have a clip here. Let's play that clip of Sigma. We want to present your Sigma. It's a voice translating device that allows you to communicate in 25 languages. So you're seeing it presses the button. You talk. a centimeter square. I guess you could clip it to your jacket. And then it instantly translates uh, into the language you've selected. Now, I think this means like it's sort of like C-3PO or Lieutenant Commander Data or a tricorder. Uh, thoughts on this one, Gina or Farhan? I think it's really cool. I mean, it seems to me like it is a it is a uh, exactly what you would want from technology and replaces the the translation book and i just think it's super neat i i think it's a good idea it just seems to have a high potential to be vaporware because it's a very hard problem and i wonder how well it works and i wonder in how many situations it works i mean translating many different languages into one another in a way that's sort of in in kind of offline mode is difficult and this oh, does... the videos that I, the videos that I saw didn't really show any like many real world examples of it actually working. So I I wonder about that. Yeah, I think this is kind of vaporwareish too. Like, is this actually going to work or not? And then if it does work, there have been people who have done apps and stuff like that where you can take an app out and do this. I think in the past, but boy, is this I guess showing the potential. Um, it, it, it's pretty. I think it's pretty much a lock that in 10 or 20 years this might work, don't you think? Yeah, I think yes. at some point. I think Google will solve it. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> this is, so, I mean, it's, I, this is one of the things I love about Indiegogo and Kickstarter. It's like people just put stuff up there and they build it even if it's going to come out really shitty. <laughs> Which I know they Indiegogo and Kickstarter might I, – I mean that in the best way. Like people are willing to suck on Kickstarter or Indiegogo. Like they're willing actually to put themselves out there and build a product. And I'm not saying this one is going to suck. But it's probably going to suck, right? Don't you think, Farhad? Yeah, but I mean you, you, I think the, the initial bid was like $50 or something. So you're not out that much if, if it doesn't work. So it's a good bet to take. This is what I love. I just love about this crowdfunding stuff is that people have these nutty ideas that really they shouldn't be working on yet. Like yeah. it should be ten years from now, but they start anyway. Um, right. All right. Fine. Well, and I would yeah, say ahead, that that's the best part of. I mean, you know this better than most. The best part of being a, an entrepreneur entrepreneur is the fact there are no shoulds. Yeah. Right. Like you know, Instagram shouldn't have worked. Somebody, you know, Flickr should have done it. You yeah. Know, like there's all of these things that the way that the world logically is supposed to work, and what's so cool about what we do and how we do it is the fact that, you know, the first step is trying. <laughs> exactly. All right, here we go. Uh, and the next step is getting your heart broken because it's absolutely false and you're a complete embarrassment. And then you keep going and then eventually it hits, right? Two thirds out of these, two, two -thirds of these companies fail. All right, here we go. Evernote Market. This is a uh, 2.0 type thing. They're uh, trying to bridge the uh, chasm between paper holdouts and digital enthusiasts. Plus they have socks. 
So this is their marketplace. I'm showing the site right now. I guess you can buy stylus here. I don't know. What exactly is this even about? It's just they, they I know they have the moleskin deal, but I guess a printer. They also have, I think another one was post-its this week. So now you can take photos of post-its and depending on the color of the post-it, it like files as a different action in your. Ah, your that's Evernote. fascinating. What, what do you, you, either of you guys use Evernote? Um, I use it sometimes. It's yeah. for some things. Now wait, you're both I see I fit the same exact profile. We got to unpack this a little bit. I'm an occasional Evernote user. Like I keep 3 or 4 documents in there that I check every week, but I'm not like 100% because I'm using Google Docs for a bunch of stuff. Why are you guys sort of like half in and half out with Evernote, Gina? Um it it just hasn't yet become a daily habit mm. or a daily practice, and Google Docs has. Right. And it's very interesting on my team um Evernote is a religion. So it's just, I think it's kind of, you know, what you, what you start with mm. and, you know, what becomes a daily practice for you. And why do you think the people who become religious about it become religious about it? Is there something in the UI or the, is there some behavioral hook that makes people addicted to it? I think they love the UI and they love the fact that it just is totally seamless across devices. Ah. And you know, I think if you look at, at, or at least from my perspective, when you look at what Spotify has done and Evernote has done, and you know, there's a couple of other products here and there, it just feels totally integrated, no matter where you are. Mm. And I think that that's one of the real benefits of Evernote. And 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 you know, I just think I think it's gorgeous. I mean, they've done a really nice job. It's a really interesting point. Um, the there seems to be a new defensive defensibility that's coming to our industry, right? Because it was like, oh, anybody can build anything Not in a weekend. Much. But now it's like, yeah, but do you have it for a Chrome extension and a you know, Chrome OS? Do you have it for Android? Do you have a Windows 8? Do you have a BlackBerry? Do you have it for iOS? And Dropbox, Evernote, Spotify, Twitter. These are some of the few brands that have it on every single platform. That means they that's probably right. have, what, five or six tech teams for five or six different major platforms. Yeah, it's, it is... It, it is a very interesting time from a development perspective and a product development perspective because of the fact that the conventional thinking is super small team, extraordinarily low cost, go to AngelList for your, you know, your $250,000 or $500,000, and yet when you start to, to pull on the string, I would argue as a, as a product person, you know, five years ago, it was much easier to do development right. and you could be, you could actually move a lot faster because you were just developing for the web. Yeah. Now it's web and, and mobile web. And actually, <laughs> and you were only developing at that point for two browsers in Firefox and yeah. IE because Chrome didn't even exist. Right. And now it's different versions of Chrome, Safari, Android. Safari, you know, mobile web on on. versus regular yeah. web, responsive web. I mean, it's getting to the point at which, yeah, yeah, you have to have like five or six teams. I'm just upstairs for the inside project. Like, we have to get an Android lead. We need a BlackBerry person. We need an Evernote. We need somebody for Windows 8. It's crazy. Uh, what do you think of the Evernote? Why, Farhad, are you not all in on um, Evernote? You seem like another toe dipper. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say it's similar to what Gina said. Like, I, I think I, I mostly just got used to um, to Google Docs and that's sort of what I use. Um, and I never really kind of got into Evernote. I, I recognize it as like, and I know lots of people who, who do feel that way, that, that it's their religion. Um, it just hasn't become like a personal thing for me. Um, I also think it's probably better for people who do um, uh, use pen and paper sometimes because it's, it, one of its killer features is this uh, is the way that it can OCR everything so yeah. like, it can search it can search handwritten notes um, and I just don't have that use case very often but if I did I'd probably use Evernote a lot my fa there, I'll tell you this like two use cases for me I have this thing called LiveScribe um, which is a pen. I have I have that too I'm a huge fan of that yeah so now LiveScribe is a pen that now they added Wi-Fi to it. Now, I tried LiveScribe years ago, and I didn't like it because you had to plug your pen in, then it would sync your pen. But what they do now is they have Wi-Fi on it. So you use this LiveScribe pen in a journal with their paper, which has like a grid system on it. It can record the audio that's going on in the room and then link it to what you're writing on the page if you're taking notes so you can co covertly record what's going on in the meeting. Not that I would do that. But you basically take notes. Now with the Wi-Fi, 
it syncs the pen's data and then it puts it into my Evernote. So I have every page of all my journals. If I ever lose those journals, and I'll definitely throw them out, uh, it's all my handwriting in there. So I don't, I don't take notes now because I need that notes. I take notes because it helps my long-term memory. It helps me process stuff. And boy, is that like LiveScribe amazing. So do you use LiveScribe, Farhad, when you're like doing interviews with people or how do you yeah i do but i haven't i haven't hooked it to my evernote though i i use their own software so that's a good idea i should do that yeah and now, um, do you use the yeah. record audio feature and do people know you're using it yes they do know i'm, I'm using it okay but let's be honest there have no, been time I, I, honestly there, have you ever I, hit that record button without telling the person i have not no oh such a liar honestly. see i'm a poker player i'm I totally see the telling live the truth. are you telling the truth you're sure yeah it, okay. it would be i I it mean, I think unethical. it's illegal. So. <laughs> is it illegal to covertly record somebody? I think it depends on the state. You're a journalist. What states is it legal? Yeah, in, in California, you need a you need two party consent. In New York, I do one not party. Know in New York. It's, yeah, I think it's okay. one party. But anyway, so you you actually tell them, hey, I'm just going to hit record, and you do it with your pen, and they're like, you can record with your pen. Yeah, it's it's funny because I you know go to a bunch of tech companies with with engineers who have seen like a lot of cool technology, but the pen is something they all want to talk about. Like it's a, it's very like uh, geeky friend, like a, something that impresses geeks. So that's cool. I think LiveScribe is going to win the startup of the week, even though they didn't launch anything. All right, here <laughs> yeah. we go. Uh, <laughs> you're not a LiveScribe user, are you, Gina? I'm not. You are now. Not. If you're hearing the two of us geek out on it, yeah. No, uh, I just sold like 30 live. Hey, make take a note, somebody in the uh, control room over here. Get LiveScribe as a sponsor of this program. I'll, I'll sell a hell out of that pen. Uh, okay, so launch of the week, uh, Jump Cam. We saw had collaborative. Uh, lets people create collaborative videos with their Facebook friends and their social network like Vine. If all your friends could immediately add to each other's video clips, and they raised 2.7 million dollars from Trinity and Google Ventures. That's our first startup, Jump Cam. Uh, and our second one is Sigmo. It's a Kickstarter. No, it's an Indiegogo campaign. That is a uh, tiny translation chip that you clip on. Who knows if it works or not? And then the Evernote marketplace where you can buy socks and pens and all kinds of interesting things. Gina, which is your startup of the week? Which is your launch of the week? I like the voice translator. Why? I'm, 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 going, I'm going for the underdog. Um, because I think it's ambitious and I think it's needed. And even if it's not quite there yet, I like the fact that they're trying. Awesome. Uh, and Farhad, what did you like best? Um, I think I'm going to agree with Gina. I'm going to go with the, even though I said it's vaporware, it would be such a huge thing if it worked well. And I do like that they're trying. Like, it's good that people are trying these, uh, you know, crazy things. All right, I'll take you through mine. Uh, jump cut, a uh, jump ca cut, cut, cam. There's another startup called Jump Cut that I think I bought by Yahoo. Um, jump cam is kind of fascinating. I think that's got the best chance to get an uptick in users immediately. Evernote's market is nice, but that's not really revolutionary. So then it's between Sigmo and Jump Cam. Sigmo is clearly Star Trek science fiction awesomeness. Jump Cam is definitely going to appeal to a certain group of people and be bigger in the short term. But I have to agree, Sigmo is going to win the trifecta. I agree that's the most ambitious thing. And I love the fact that it's a wearable, like press a button kind of a thing. I think that's just totally awesome to have a have it be a hardware device not just like an app on your phone um so anyway congrats to sigma you won this week all right uh last up in the news this week uh, gadgets are going to be okay to use on planes during takeoff and landing apparently um although the that wasn't the case on the southwest flight where i had the you know you know this move uh, gina where the person comes and they hit, they press the button on your seat and then they put their hand on the back of the seat and push you forward i got that this week that was I, I don't understand why they do that on Southwest. They're like, oh, can you put your seat up? And they just slam your seat forward for you. I'm like, yeah, I was going to put it up, but you did it for me. I um, just don't think that you're capable of, of figuring out the mechanics of it. Yes. They're just it, trying to help. Yeah, it's easy to put down, but very hard to, to get the seat to go right. back up. Right. Um, but at this least you got a club, a club soda at the same time. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so the Federal Aviation Committee Advisory Committee recommended Thursday – that airline passengers be allowed, hallelujah, to use smartphones, tablets, e-readers, and other personal electronics, electronic devices during Taylor Atlanta, according to industry officials familiar with the deliberations. Uh, any thoughts on this from my, uh, my round table? Great. Yeah. I, I, love to see, I love to see when rationality wins. Right. It's, the other thing is, like, why is this, I mean, it was a lie the entire time that it was it was a lie the entire time that it was going to interfere with the plane, 
right? Yeah. I mean, it was just a lie. <laughs> I think there were no, there were no studies that, that bore that, bore that out. Yeah. Did it, was it Nick Bilton who like really pushed this or did he jump is on the bandwagon? This is his crusade. Yeah. Well, see, he single handedly changed the, changed the law. I'm going to have to say, like, based on the amount of flying I do, I probably owe Nick Bilton, Nick Bilton, the New York Times bits writer. I mean, he, <laughs> this is kind of a, and Alec Baldwin's not going to get um, thrown off planes anymore, apparently, for words of friends. This could rebound Zynga's stock. Single yeah, I think this is, on the other hand, I think this is bad for newspapers and, and print books. I mean, yeah. like, if you, if you, like, I used to buy a print newspaper just to fill that time every time I went on a plane. Me um, too, yeah, no, actually. That. that was me. I was doing takeoff and yeah. landings uh, based on that as well. Uh, okay, hey, listen, BlackBerry, uh, the final chapter, $4.7 million deal from Fairfax Financial Holdings to go private. Um, da -da -da -da. God, it's been tough for them. Um, what do you think is going to happen here? Obviously, um, the smartphone space is incredibly competitive. I bought the uh, Q10 device, loved it. Um, but is it just, is it just over for BlackBerry? What do you guys think? Um, um it seems like it's over. Yeah. <laughs> well, I what mean, happens, it seems like they, they still have billions of dollars in revenue and a hundred million people using the phones and they still have all these corporate clients. Do you think there's going to be an enterprise future for them? Farhad? It's really hard to see how there's an enterprise future, right? Because a lot of our... Our, our devices now are consumer devices that people want to use for home and for work. I don't, I mean, maybe there are, there probably are some organizations that have this, you know, very high security or, or special needs that only BlackBerry can meet at this point. But I, I, su I suspect that, you know, both Android and iOS will be able to um, work in those organizations at some point. And, um, I don't really know if you can be an enterprise company these days, um, like an enterprise hardware, especially a phone company that doesn't have, um, you know, a vital consumer side because that's where the innovation is happening. So I don't know. It's really hard to see how they can survive doing enterprise alone. Uh, Gina, any thoughts? Requiem for Blackbird? You know, I, I mean, I feel like as, a, as an industry, we, we tend to turn on companies pretty quickly. In this case, I mean, it's sad. Like, this is just sad. And, and in technology, things die. But I do think that there is a whole set of entrenched enterprise solutions that, you know, will just take time to move off of. And they seem to have the right partner for harvesting the cash. I doubt, I doubt we're going to see a turnaround BlackBerry. Um, but at the same point in time, you know, SGI went out of business, you know, what seemed like 10 years after they theoretically went out of business. So these things always take longer for their ultimate demise than... than yeah, I mean, and then to. you have Yahoo making a rebound and AOL making a resurgence, so it is possible, um, even, but it is Hard hard. Hardware, yeah, hardware is different than software. That's a fair point, yeah. Um, it does seem, though, the patents are worth something, and... Who would be a crazy person to buy this? I mean, if Yahoo bought it or Facebook bought it to make it, you know, their operating system and try to make a go at Android, would that be absolutely insane? Or would BlackBerry, you know, fit well in the Facebook, you know, updating my status kind of world? What do you guys think? I mean, it's not even, it's, it's, it's sort of, it's not valuable as a brand for those companies. It's not like the cool brand. Like, Facebook would have to kind of, rehabilitate BlackBerry's brand to do that. Mm. Um, and I don't really, and that seems like, I don't see what Facebook would get out of that. Um, you know, Microsoft would have been the ideal company to buy them. But yeah, they should have done three Nokia. years ago. Yeah. But now, Farhad, you used to, on your BlackBerry, be able to file and write a full column, I'm guessing, or half a column? You mean because of, of the hard keys? Like, yeah. Did you ever do that? You ever write a column on your BlackBerry? I never, I never wrote a full column, but but yeah, I mean, it was there were some applications for which hard keys were were really great. Like I'm still not a very like I still make tons of typos on, and I don't want to write long email on on my iPhone. And um, see, this is what I think the huge opportunity is. Like nobody can write anything more than a couple of sentences with two typos in it. And with my BlackBerry, yeah, but then, but then I'm still doing sixty, seventy words a minute. 
What's that? Yeah. Well, but you sacrifice all the screen space that you know the hardware that the keyboard takes us. I still and see tons of people carrying a BlackBerry and a phone, and it's just. It's, yeah, it's crazy because you can't get work done with a, with any of these big glass smartphones. You can't type. I don't know. Maybe I'm just. I guess I am a dinosaur. Hey, um, Apple has hired one of Nike's top few band designers to work on wearable devices. This is breaking news. Uh, ben Schaefer, according to a source at Nike, with knowledge of the details, um, is Apple going to come out with a phone and when? And what do you think this does for the Nike Apple relationship? You mean a watch? A watch. What did I say? A few phone. Bo- a phone. Yeah. No, they have a phone. A watch. Rather, to complement their phone. Um, I'm sure they. I mean, I'm sure they're working on it. I just don't know if they'll come. You know, they they work on a lot of things. So we'll see. How, I, I bet they're they're watching to see how the others fare and whether it it works and whether people like these the whole idea. What do you think, Gina? Or do you have any sort of? I know you're connected to a lot of people. Is the and we know they're working on a watch of some type. Do you think it's absolutely coming out, or do you think it's maybe coming out based on the lukewarm reaction that the other watches have had? Yeah, I I, I don't know. Um, I think that that's actually one of the the fun things here is the fact that Apple keeps you guessing. Um, And then when they do come out, um, it's fun. Um, What I just think is cool is the fact that they continue to attract great talent, and that's always the first step in any of this stuff. Yeah, and uh, Steve Ballmer, t- yeah, so I mean, they do have the talent there. It's going to be very interesting to see if they want to go after, I wonder if they're, instead of working on a watch, what they're working on is more like a fuel band, where it's like, so you have, you'll have you have an Apple fuel band that maybe gives you a little SMS messages and is more of a pedometer. Maybe they're working on something a little bit less ambitious than people think. Well, it's kind of I interesting. That. That the, the, I, yeah, I doubt that. You think the, they're going um, for you. The the five S the iPhone five S has you know this this chip in it that can do a lot of the motion stuff by itself and it seems like it could that could be um, you know the phone could be their way of doing the fuel band. Um, that's interesting. You, the only problem with that is you do take your phone out to charge it and leave right. it around and then you don't know. Whereas the wristband is persistent, so it seems like it'd be a great con- uh, great. Uh, compliment. Okay, uh, finishing up, uh, Bomber bids a cheerful farewell to Microsoft, but promises they will deliver the next big thing. Um, what do you guys think about the future of Microsoft with Bomber leaving? Everybody wanted him to leave. Not everybody, but there was obviously a big chorus of people. We need to get somebody in there who's a product person, et cetera, you know, the equivalent of there, Marissa. What's going to happen going forward with Microsoft, Gina? I don't know. I mean, it's such a massive, massive, massive company. I don't think that you could turn it around or turn it in a a different direction that fast. It'll also be an interesting question whether it's internal or external talent that they bring in. I think external talent will be very difficult. Um, I think the interesting question about Microsoft is you know, in their next chapter and their next transformation, are they going to continue to essentially create a parallel proprietary universe of everything that the rest of the world is using, you know, from Apple and other sources, you know, in this weird tile Microsoft way? Um, And I think that that's going to be the really, the most interesting thing from my perspective watching it is, are they going to just keep building out like, oh, you like the cloud? Well, here's our proprietary. Here's our Azure. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, oh, you like, you know, the iPhone? Here's our proprietary version of it. And I just think that that strategy has not really worked all that well um, for yeah. a variety of, of, of different reasons. But I just, I, I look at Microsoft as being so gigantic and so complex. It's a little bit like saying, you know, you can predict how you would create change in the Pentagon or in, you know, or in as government. president of the United States. Right. Cause you have, right. you have a Nintendo in the building, you have a Yahoo in the building and you have a whole business software, IBM in the building. And right. then you've got an AWS in the building. I mean, it is, it's a really great point. I mean, there's, there's five, six companies in there. It, so then the, I guess the logic would be to break it up maybe, and then have two or three people running it. Farhad, what do you think is going to happen? Um, no, I feel I 
agree with a lot of what Gina said. I mean, they're in this really hard place. They're stuck between Google and Apple. Like, they can't make. They're you. They're trying to do this middle way where they make where they make um, an operating system in a world where an operating system for phones is free versus another company that makes devices, and and they have all these other businesses. I feel like they need somebody to come in to decide what Microsoft is, to decide whether it wants to be this you know IBM like enterprise company or whether it's going to be some kind. Of Gonna, you know, continue to work on this consumer stuff. I feel like it, you know, obviously it just does too many things right now without much focus. And like, somebody needs to fix that. Um, I mean, it's not. I don't think it's dead or close to dying or anything. No, it's throwing off it, tens of billions of dollars. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. In addition to making a lot of money, but it's but it's got like these huge problems that. I don't really know, and I can't think of who would be great to solve this. Um, you know, did you, obviously we read that rumor or report that um, that Alan Mulally is uh, the front runner now. So I don't. That seems weird. Yeah, this is. A, it's going to be very interesting to see what they do. You know, circling back to our earlier part of the conversation, when Gina was talking about like Evernote's on every platform, Spotify's on every platform. I think what they should do is, since they're going to have a hard time. Getting dominance on Windows Mobile, and they and Bomber said in this sort of exit interview that his biggest regret was that they didn't focus on the phone in 2002, 2003, and really just nail that. Why not just take all this money and buy Evernote, buy Spotify, buy every app company that's cross-platform, and get 20 of the greatest apps across all platforms, and then that would give you the glue between you know all these different emerging universes, and you could be the app company. You know, you'd be the software layer. Across all hardware, you don't have to have your own proprietary hardware like the service. You could, but just you know, have Evernote, and you have all those users, and they can graduate to Office or whatever. So, I mean, that's my advice I, to them. What I mean, you? I think th I, when I read that, I thought that was actually really creative and really good thinking. And I'm not saying that because you're the host of the show. <laughs> um, I, I actually think one of the biggest challenges of a company that is, you know, basically a monopoly that has generated so much cash and has won numerous battles is that they become arrogant about what they could do relative to recognizing I think something that has really emerged in the last in the last three years in this new app world, which is brand matters. Um, so when you think about actually if you have cash the opportunity to buy brand and mm. even just run it as a as a portfolio I think makes a ton of sense yeah. and I think that that's where you know when you look at what will go down as some of the best acquisitions in in technology history whether that's Google buying YouTube or or Facebook buying Instagram or eBay buying PayPal I, I think that that you know if 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 you can get to that place strategically where you could do that kind of very ambitious roll up because you have the cash to be able to get it done there's a i mean that's a bright shining future for a variety of different reasons and yet i think for most for most companies that have gotten to a point where they have that much cash arrogance gets in the way yeah they don't want to they want to believe they can build dropbox they want to believe they can build paypal right and listen google tried to build microsoft google. yeah exactly microsoft ate live open storage you mean yeah exactly like how many names are we going to do that? <laughs> you know like but yeah. if you look at you know the it's very um astute uh, observation there if you look google before they bought youtube did google video they failed then they uh shut that down and had youtube eBay had their own payment system that they tried to get going. They failed. They got PayPal. So in almost all of these instances where – what was the third one you did? We had eBay, PayPal. Instagram. Oh, Instagram. Instagram. Was the yeah, and, what, and Facebook tried to get photos and you know, you know, mobile photos going, and it didn't work. They put filters on their you know, nonsense, and still you know, the urban market didn't want to embrace it. So let's buy it for a billion dollars. I mean that's going to be – Right now, YouTube is ten percent. It's five billion dollars. That's like ten percent of YouTube of Google's overall revenue, a billion dollars in profit. That's going to be the best acquisition ever. PayPal's half of YouTube of eBay's revenue, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you think, Farhad, of this strategy? Buy buy up all the apps. What do you think? Uh, good or strategy. Multiple, I would I would buy uh, Box, LinkedIn. Um, sort of LinkedIn's the, not going the, anywhere. That's thirty billion. Yeah. Right. I mean, Twenty five well, billion. They could. 
Hey, some kind of strategic partnership. They need, they need, they need the kind of the roller de- rolodex of the future, and they need, they need uh, these enterprise apps that are kind of eating into their share right now. So um, well, I would go after those idea. people. That's a, there yeah. is a fascinating idea: buy LinkedIn and have Jeff become the CEO of Microsoft. Hey, I I think that would be the best thing. That's a fascinating. Well, we should float that. We can write your next column. You, you got. I I, you're a twice I actually weekly? wrote that column. I wrote you that did? column at Sleep. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Write it again for Wall Street Journal. You get paid okay. for it twice. We should. I will float that one again. All right. Listen, this has been an amazing program. Thank you, Farhad Manju. Everybody, follow F M A N J O O F Man Joe, but it's Jew J O O and uh, Gina Thanks. B. Uh, at Gina B on uh, Twitter. Follow uh, them and check out uh, uh, Farhad's amazing column now in the Wall Street Journal. And follow his Twitter handle if you want poop jokes. Uh, well done on the poop <laughs> joke. No, you got like a zillion followers this week. Yes. And I. And then you decide to do a tweet, which I can't, I don't even know if I can say the tweet on air. You can say it. It, you, it wasn't so bad. <laughs> I think it was pretty horrific. You tweeted. <laughs> What what's worse? Right. Uh, Adam, you want me to do it? <laughs> yeah, you do it, please. I'm uncomfortable. I'm sorry. You tweet. <laughs> tell, read the, read the tweet. This is the tweet after you get ten thousand new followers from the Wall Street Journal. Go. I said, "What's grosser, human poop or dog poop?" It's. I mean, that's an obvious answer. Human poop, but that's. Uh, I think that you is know, I got, I got, a, I got a variety of answers there. <laughs> I bet you did. Uh, well, the Wall Street Journal now um, is, I'm sure, very proud. Um, <laughs> and yeah. uh, check out Mighty <laughs> Bell, Mighty Bell, um, and start your own community. And uh, sorry, thanks a lot for coming on the program, Gina. Any other plugs, Gina? My pleasure. Yeah. Any any plugs? Anything to plug? Go to leanin.org. Go to leanin.org. Start a Lean In Circle. Create a Mighty Bell community. Beautiful. All right. And Have a more interesting life. Exactly. Hey, are you, <laughs> if you want to come to launch, if either of you want to come to launch mobile and wearables on Monday and Tuesday, uh, email me. I'll get you a ticket set up. Uh, it's in San Francisco. And Farhar, thanks for coming on the program. Great. Thanks. thanks. Good to be here. All right. Bye. We'll see you next time on this weekend. Oh, and thanks to our sponsors, Turnstone and uh, Mandrill. Thanks for sponsoring the program. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.